Good morning, everyone. We're going to shift our focus a little bit uh, to adult learning and workforce development uh, now. Um, the, uh, we do not have a PowerPoint. Um, we, we discussed it and decided not to do that. Um, and part of, the, part of the reason for that is that we really wanted to have a, a, a discussion and that so much of workforce development is about helping people attain a better quality of life. You know, whether that is helping them get the literacy skills they need, the digital skills, the other kind of skills that they need to get a job, to get a better job, all those kinds of things. And so much of that is about connecting with people, not just in the library, but in the greater community, and increasingly going out to them as opposed to them coming into us. And beginning to address uh, the challenges and barriers that so many people face around uh, learning as adults, like literacy, like language, like uh, disability, uh, like transportation and other practical kinds of things that uh, keep people from, from uh, taking advantage of opportunities. Uh, I think you'll hear from uh, our three panelists uh, the great and innovative work that they're doing in their libraries uh, around adult learning. And so much, of, so much of the work that they'll be talking about uh, is happening in collaboration and in partnerships with agencies outside the library, which I think is exciting. So our three panelists today are um, Carissa uh, Tashjian, a Literacy Program Coordinator for Providence Public Library, uh, Dio Jika, Director of Learning and Literacy, Queensborough Public Library, and Cindy Gibbon, who is the Access and Information Services Director for, Mc for McNulma County Library. So uh, Carissa. So I'm so fortunate to be in this room like many of you feel, um, being able to talk about adult education and workforce development together um, as a priority for IMLS moving forward. And I am the director of an adult education agency in Rhode Island and we serve mainly immigrants and we're a collaboration of five city libraries, different city libraries working together. So I'm often in rooms where adult education is discussed. I'm in rooms where workforce development is discussed and where libraries are discussed, but rarely, I find, they're discussed together. So we, about two years ago, we received a grant, a national leadership grant from IMLS, and it's come out to be what we call all access, adult lifelong learning in the libraries. And our goal has been really about um, putting down barriers for mainly four populations, people with low literacy, low educational attainment, people with disabilities, and people with low digital literacy. Um, it's really, though, serving everyone, we're finding very quickly, unemployed, underemployed people. And what we're doing is um, we're creating new learning and funding models. And how that's been implemented is we have learning lounges in libraries that are open access for um, adults to come in and improve their education and employment needs. Uh, we have an assistive technology exploration station uh, through a partnership where people can come in and find out how technology can help them with a, a prescribed disability or not. Um, we have iPad clubs, typing clubs, one-on-one um, -on -one technology appointments where adults can meet with librarians one-on-one -on -one for help. And I have to tell you, the list keeps growing because our main goal is what is the barriers for adults getting the education and employment they need and how can we adjust and um, make programs to help that. And so it's really been about a continuum of care and really talking about no more silos. And interestingly, um, our partnership is really in involves workforce development and adult education and libraries and others. And the more they get to know us, the more they want to do with us. And that's one of the big lessons I'm learning. And, but it takes a lot of time and effort. And I, someone was saying earlier about the, it's really like different alphabet soups of acronyms. You really need a list when you go in. And um, you know, as we all are driven by different outcomes, those systems have different outcomes that we have to be aware of um, so that we can have really meaningful partnerships. So I came into this work because 
I've been in so many rooms where I hear um, workforce development say, well, send them to send that person to the library. They'll help you with a cover letter. And then I hear in adult education, they'll help you with your computer knowledge, right? But from my standpoint, we rarely receive the funding to do that. And, and are we really doing the best for people in, in what those services are? So there are 36 million adults in the, just a recent survey that need basic skills in the country. And I would argue that skills building is all of our business. And the adult education system is woefully underfunded in this state, in the country. Um, in my program along, we constantly have waiting lists um, for services. So I'm familiar with many of these worlds and I find that it's absolutely clear that public libraries can be a major solution to these challenges. Um, we're open access, adults have m work many jobs, um, juggling family, they can't often go to adult education classes or the workforce development system or centers, but they can come to the libraries if we uh, personalize our services around their needs. It's very patron focused. Um, I want to tell you one thing. In, in Rhode Island, we have 71 library locations. We're the smallest state in the country, right? But we have three workforce development centers, one stops. Think of the capacity and the, and the barriers overcome just by doing things in all those libraries. So, uh, you know, I would have to say that one thing that's been really helpful is the depth of partnerships that we've developed because I can't be in all those rooms. But all of our partners are in those rooms and they're speaking up on our behalf. So I want to tell you about a really urgent need we have right now with the new Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This is the new legislation um, for the workforce development system and adult education in our country. And public libraries are noted as eligible partners as one stops. Um, and that we're important providers. But what does that really mean? Right now, in your states, they're required to develop unified plans um, of how they're going to work together for workforce development. But I like to ask the question, how many libraries are in those rooms in those conversations right now? I've been knocking on the door and it's been really hard. And I'm imagining the same is true. So for us to fully realize that public libraries are in WIOA, that's the that's the legislation, how does that, how can we really take full advantage of that? And I'm going to talk about my priorities for that in a little bit, um, and for, I mean, for IMLS, the priorities moving forward, but I think we need to come up with a system so it's not a matter of knocking on doors. Um, I've heard many conversations or comments here that libraries are overlooked. I see it. I definitely see that. And so um, if we could do work in the future of how to meaningfully implement that we are at the table, um, there's a lot of sources of funding that could really help us. So thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Dio Chica, and I'm um, the director of learning and literacy for Queens Library. And I wanted to contextualize my comments um, first by describing the types of programming um, that we do at Queens Library. And, and Queens uh, Queens Borough, in particular, is the borough. It, it, uh, one of the the, the biggest borough in New York City that has the largest immigrant population. So, and so it, within that context, uh, we have to uh, um, respond to the demand. So we have seven adult learning centers. We have three sites for young adult literacy programs as well as ESOL classes, about 100 a year at 28 libraries. And so that means that we're under pressure to always meet the challenges. In, in most of our registration where we do intake and assessment as well as pre-testing, um, because th these are structured programming funded by government um, grants, uh, we typically turn away about 40% of our students because we just don't have enough seats. So that really poses a challenge to staff as well as to program administration and how to better meet the challenges. Um, and in particular, it's always a discussion about funding, um, right? So w when we're looking at city operating budget as well as, uh, as our government grants, we're always looking at how we can uh, um, share resources. Um, one, one of the great things though is that I, I think that uh, a lot of the government agencies have recognized that um, with adult, uh, adult programming requires uh, um, that there needs to be partnerships. So we run two literacy zones um, and it's really uh, uh, 
uh, for, uh, follows the sort of program model that adult education is the front and center of, of, of really bringing together all the partnerships within a certain community by a service area sort of model, right? So we have guiding coalitions where we have at least 20 to 25 people who come programs who come to our uh, sites and we talk about uh, what's our strategic direction, what's our planning in terms of how do we increase and enhance our programming. So that's something that we always look at um, at Queen's Library. Um, we serve about 5,000 um, um, unduplicated uh, um, um, per, uh, students um, a year um, in, our, in all of our programming. And that's why I think uh, um, the, our IMLS grant in particular was poses really a great opportunity um, uh, the IMLS grant that we have is really was to tr better train our librarians and immigrant services, right? Um, and Queen's Library has about 65 community library locations. So this was really a great opportunity for our adult education program, prog program folks to work with our 65 community libraries to figure out what, so, so first year of that grant we developed the curriculum, second year we developed uh, the training and we're actually going through training right now where we have to train 400 plus librarians on immigrant services. So it's really a great collaboration even within Green's Library on how to better improve our services. And one of the things that we really looked at in our curriculum was what model are we gonna use throughout this training? Because typically in adult programming, we utilize case management. So we have student files for every single student that comes into our center and we follow them because we pre-test them and then we, we look at attendance and retention and then we post-test them based on educational gain. And that's how we continue to get our funding. Um, and then we've had discussions with our community libraries because typically we look at headcounts in our community libraries. And so the compromise that we, we came up with is really to be the facilitators for information, right? So this is really a new model uh, um, that our IMLS grant has sort of kind of created this opportunity for collaboration within um, our, our community libraries and our librarians. But there are challenges, especially, and, I, uh, um, uh, and, and uh, Carissa mentioned uh, um, it, it with WIOA, um, the, a new legislation that is just being rolled out right now, but also with Common Core um, state standards and the new task in New York State uh, in terms of the instructional shifts required uh, um, by our programming uh, um, to be able to really prepare our students. So we have ABE classes, adult basic education, as well as ESOL, but we also have pre-HSE um, as aligned to the new common core standards. Um, and actually last week was the first, uh, second year that we conducted our graduation where students actually came in with caps and gowns um, uh, um, where, and they achieved, you know, uh, they passed the, the exam in all five areas reading, writing, social studies, math, and science. And it was really the first cohort um, of students, 165 that we graduated, that predominantly had to pass all five sections um, according to the new task, the new GED exam, testing uh, uh, for secondary completions, test assessing for secondary completion. Um, and so those are the kind of things, and, and the things that we've looked at, um, not just uh, funding, but also what do we need to do in terms of professional development and training uh, for our staff because one of the things that, that we're, uh, we, we're also developing with the Department of Labor is developing a curriculum on task transition. And we actually canvassed the entire um, field in terms of who out there uh, that could help us develop this curriculum. And it's still being, it's the, 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 the common core is still strickling into the adult ed world in terms of how do you actually take these standards and apply it into the classroom? What literary practices do we need to, cha to change in the classroom to better prepare our students for the TAS exam? Because um, we, uh, and because it, it seems like the statistics have shown that for most of our students, uh, um, uh, um, the math and the writing seems to be the most um, challenging for all of them. So, so that means, again, another opportunity for what kind of programming. So we've developed programming and classes that particularly look at the math and the science in particular to help really prepare our students for the TAS exam. Um, and I think it's gonna continue to do that. So in terms of priorities for future, for, for future funding, we're gonna discuss that a little bit later. I think we're gonna go through all of our recommendations, but really this is a, a, a lot of things that we need to look to be looking at. One of the things though, in terms of opportunities that we've had to look at is really uh, mirror the changes that are happening in, uh, with WIOA and with the Common Core in that we've really looked at 
integrating all our different departments. So we actually integrated our, uh, our adult learner program with our workforce development and looked at it as a continuum of services from the perspective of student needs. So that's something that we've done. We've also incorporated our New Americans programming under one umbrella of services so that when we are looking at students during intake and assessment and during pre-testing, we are cross-referring not only to other programs that would provide service, social services for them, but also within um, our own departments in terms of adult learning uh, towards uh, um, workforce development, as well as uh, legal services for a lot of our student ESOL students who might need those services. So, um, so that's something I think both challenges as well as opportunities for really great program enhancements. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Gibbon, the Access and Information Services Director from Multnomah County Library in Portland, Oregon. And I want to start by telling you about a recent IMLS project. Um, we're just getting off the ground, but we think that it has uh, great promise to uh, create some baseline data for us um, to start measuring the outcomes of what we're doing in libraries. Uh, this grant um, has a lengthy title, it's quite a mouthful. It's called Advancing Digital Equity in Public Libraries, Assessing Library Patrons Problem Solving in Technology Rich Environments. Um, like I said, it's quite a mouthful. Um, this is a partnership funded by IMLS between the Multnomah County Library, an urban library, and an urban university, Portland State University. Uh, Dr. Jill Kastik um, is in the audience. She will be on the research panel later today. And um, Jill is with Portland State's Literacy, Language, and Technology Research Group. And we're gonna be working together to do an assessment um, using a tool that has been validated on an international level to understand the readiness of working age adults to uh, be in the workforce and use the technology that is available today that you have to be proficient with um, as a worker. PIOC, the Program for the International Assessment of Adult Competencies, comes out of the workforce development world um, not a world where libraries are necessarily thought to have a place at the table, um, as we've been hearing from the other panelists. Um, it has three assessment areas, literacy, numeracy, and this new one, problem solving in technology rich environments. Um, well, the library, of course, is a technology rich environment. So this uh, relates very well to what people do in libraries as well as to what people do in the workforce. The idea here is to measure the skills of workforce age adults in the U.S. and also internationally. Um, and in the United States, the assessment tools are validated in both English and Spanish. Um, we will be administering the problem solving in technology rich environments online tool to library patrons. Uh, and we will get some very interesting data, I think, as a result of that to help us understand where our patrons are in terms of a baseline that we can use to work from to assess what we're doing. We'll be testing a small group of library staff to start with this tool measures not basic online literacy skills. Can I use the mouse? Do I know how to navigate the screen? That kind of thing. This really uh, measures a higher level of skill. Can I manage my files? Can I look at a site and uh, understand what I'm seeing there and what the service is that's being offered to me on that site? Um, can I do something very practical, like figure out how to return the lamp that I just bought online? Um, or can I figure out how to use the online resume site or determine that the job ad I'm looking at actually is for a position that might fit my particular skill set and is something that I should be applying for. Um, we're hoping to assess 700 library patrons 
Um, some of these will be through our outreach services, some of them will be in the library, and some of them will be people coming in online through our website. Um, and we'll be doing assessments in both English and in Spanish. And of course, the goal here really is to reach out to people um, who are struggling um, and who may not be finding a place in the workforce. Well, why do we do this? Because we want to understand what our patrons need to learn to thrive in this technology-rich world that we live in. We want to create that body of baseline data um, that will help us measure outcomes, not just outputs of what we do. We want to understand the development needs of our own library workforce um, because we know that our own workforce needs better technology skills to thrive and to be able to give the service we need them to give. And we also want to bring libraries to that workforce development table. And one of the ways that we can do that is to show that we are making an impact through outcomes. Outcome measurement is, of course, the trend right now. The Public Library Association has a task force on performance measurement. They've just received, I think, a $2.5 million grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and we have to be able to show what we've been saying for so long. We know that libraries change lives but we need to be able to prove it. That's what our funders are asking for. And so this idea of outcome measurement is very important. Um, I also wanna just mention something about the development of our own library workforce, because I think this is something really important, and as we talk about priorities, I'll say more about that. But our library workforce needs to change. And, um, I particularly have noticed this at Multnomah County Library over the last few years. We have an initiative um, called We Speak Your Language. And what that initiative has really been about is making sure that people who work for the library look like people in the community. That's a real struggle for us in Portland, Oregon, um, one of the whitest cities in the country. Um, but where an increasing uh, number of our patrons speak languages other than English at home. Um, and uh, don't look like me. Uh, and so when people come into the library, we want someone to, who looks like them, who can speak their language, who understands their culture. Um, and I think that that is a trend that we need uh, to be looking toward in uh, libraries across the country. It makes a huge difference um, in how welcome people feel and whether they come to us to use our services. Um, so. As I said, we'll talk more about that when we talk uh, more about priorities. But I think library workforce development is something we really need to look to. If we want to be able to do workforce development, early childhood work, all of the areas where we're looking to people in the community who may see the library as a white middle class institution that has nothing for them, we have to overcome that. Before we open it up for questions, I ask our panelists to think about um, strategic priorities for IMLS. They've talked a lot about ch challenges and opportunities, and I think uh, coming from that, they've been thinking about some things that they would recommend as strategic priorities for IMLS in the area of adult learning and workforce development. So Carissa, would you like to start? Okay, thanks. Um, so I have uh, six ideas, and I'll go through them quickly. <laughs> uh, I I'm just learned about connected learning a few years ago, and I know how it applies to teeny teenagers, but we're really trying to push the envelope on applying that to adults and having peers learning and having learning groups in the spontaneous or informal, you could call them, in the library. We need help doing that. We can't, if you figured it out, please see me, but I'm having a hard time with it, so I think that would be just a wonderful area to go. Um, workforce investment boards, every community has them. How can we get libraries a place at that table? That would be very powerful. Um, uh, how can we co-locate services of partners in the libraries? And I'm not speaking of um, a six-week workshop. I'm speaking of a, something, a community resource that our patrons can count on week after week after week. And I do see it as a win-win situation. We do that with an assistive technology organization. They're in the library. People can count on them week to week. So let's explore more of that. Um, I really would like to continue to see the conversation continue about credentialing and certificates for workforce development, digital badges in the library that um, do 
validate skills, speaking of the maker space, um, you know, taking it that next step forward so that it can really result in jobs. <laughs> um, I would like to continue the conversation on the WIOA funds, Title I and Title II funds, how libraries can access those funds. Um, one example is in our all access IMLS funded program, that was two libraries. We have a minimum of nine other libraries in our state just wanting to create learning lounges, one-on-one -on -one tech appointments, everything we're doing in our IMLS all access program. And those could be a source of funds for making that happen. Um, lastly, uh, I'd really love the conversation that's come up so many times about um, outreach. What I'm really interested in are the people that don't come in the library and w why are they not coming in, how we can reach out to them um, and bring them in. And um, the barriers are much deeper than I ever realized. I've worked with immigrants for many, many years and through my IMLS project I did focus groups and I found many more reasons why they don't come in than I ever realized. And I'll give a little plug that we've been, here's a win-win situation, that we've been hiring our adult literacy students to work in our children's library. And they're getting workforce development skills and they're reaching out to their communities to bring people into the library. And then they also are seeing how I like you're saying, we speak your language. It's that program I didn't even realize is happening. So um, I think we could explore that much more. Thank you. Um, again, I think it's uh, challenges as well as opportunities. And I think largely based on you know, new legislation and new, uh, and, and, and new national standards. And I think we're already doing this um, it, within um, adult education programs, but uh, obviously additional program uh, additional funding would allow us to really expand our services to our students. One is capacity building, really looking at continuum of services uh, between adult ed, workforce development, and immigrant services. I think that's really important um, to develop that resource sharing and all of that. You know, I used to be in K through 12, I was a high school teacher, and whenever, when, when it comes to new standards that come out, K through 12 gets you know a, a mammoth size of the funding, but adult education gets a minuscule part of it. And so I think it's, it's good and bad. I think the good thing about it is that it really allows for a lot of innovation and a lot of partnerships because you have to um, in the field. Secondly, um, I think because of Common Core and the new GED um, exam, I, I think ongoing and in-field professional development is crucially important for instructional staff, especially as they respond to instructional shift required by the new Common Core standards. Um, and that would result in ed, more ed gain for students and more students achieving their high school equivalency diploma. Um, what we've done is that you know, we've sent um, admin staff as well as um, other staff to uh, training um, on Common Core, but you know, going to training for 12 hours per year is not enough. You really need in, in the field ongoing um, turnkey professional de development training so that teachers have an opportunity to learn about Common Core uh, from a theoretical point of view, from a research point of view, and really apply that in the classroom, right? And I think that needs to happen continually. Thirdly, um, of course, technology and infusion into the classroom is going to be important in, 20, in for 21st century. Um, especially uh, at Queen's Library, we have four um, task test centers, and we also have the National um, external diploma program, all of which are um, computer-based. Um, and I think a lot of the testing uh, um, is moving. I think New York State Ed had mentioned that by 2016, 60% of the testing is gonna, uh, is gonna happen um, computer-based. And so we really need to prepare our students uh, by infusing a lot more technology. And it isn't just, you know, send them to a computer literacy class. I think it really needs to be in in their literacy practices in the classroom. And that's how you really cement uh, uh, learning. Um, and so that when they get to the test, it's just a, a natural evolution for them. Um, and they're not uh, uh, um, you know, intimidated by the computer-based part of it, as well as the content that they need to master for the task exam. For a lot of the students, thankfully, I, I think now the, the bar for passing the, the new GED is pretty low. Uh, I think you only have, I think because they normed it uh, uh, with high school students and you only have to get 10 out of 25 questions right. But in, you know, as they develop more versions of the test, I think the standards are gonna increase. So that's coming down to pikes. And so we really need to infuse technology and more computer literacy in real time in the classroom. And that's, I think that's a third priority for me. Great, thank you. 
So I would say one of my, f my first priority probably is more research that um, supports outcome measurement. Um, mm -hmm. I really feel that this is an area that we're so far behind in in the library world. Um, and public libraries in particular uh, have a greater and greater need to be able to show outcomes and we have measured outputs, we've counted stuff for so many years. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be able to show the impact of our work. Um, so I'm, I'm, it's wonderful that PLA is moving toward um, uh, the idea of outcome measurement and the work that they're doing will be great because what they're really striving toward as I understand it is some fairly simple tools that can be implemented by any public library anywhere um, to measure impacts. But I also think that a more sophisticated level of research um, around outcomes is also still very beneficial and something that I would like to see IMLS continue to fund. Um, um, another area I wanted to point out is this idea of what does the library workforce need to be going into the future. Um, I would really love to see some more support from IMLS around understanding best practices for how we diversify our workforce, not only in its ethnic uh, makeup and its, um, and its language abilities, uh, but also in the breadth of its skill set. Um, you know, libraries need people to work in them other than librarians sometimes. Um, librarians are great. Um, we do amazing work. And in a lot of small libraries, um, librarians um, you know, really do wear every hat. Um, but we need folks who are experts in early childhood education. We need folks, folks who are expert in um, adult education and um, workforce development. Uh, we need to diversify the skill sets of the people who are working with us if we really want to achieve the impacts we need. So looking at that library workforce and figuring out what it needs to be in the future, how we train our professional staff, um, and what we do to, that, that works to recruit and bring people into libraries um, who reflect our communities and who have the skill sets we need. So those are my, my two pitches. Great. Thank you all. Uh, now we'll take questions, and I'll remind you to say your name and your organization, which I did not do <laughs> for myself. So I'm David Singleton, Charlotte Mecklenburg. Hi, so. I'm Bharat Mehra, uh, University of Tennessee. I had first a comment to make and then uh, uh, a broader question. Uh, the comment is related to the planning grant that we recently got from IMLS for uh, small businesses and public libraries to develop a blueprint for a, a toolkit. Uh, and we're doing a gap analysis. So I'm really happy to hear what Carissa mentioned uh, in terms of what we are also finding in, in that project, that uh, from the small business community end, uh, we are realizing that there's a need for, uh, for them to find appropriate workforce people with specific paraprofessional or professional skills to be able to uh, uh, fulfill various types of small businesses uh, in terms of um, uh, cost, uh, reasonable hiring and such too. And on the other side, from the librarian group, we are finding that adult uh, education is going beyond just the traditional mode of the tr uh, understanding of the adults to the uh, high school or the community college graduates who are just on the brink of becoming adults and how to be able to train them so that they can. It seems like a logical that the, the, there is in the rural areas in Tennessee, there is uh, uh, unemployment. Uh, lack of skilled uh, labor for in the labor force and from the small business side they need that at, at a reasonable cost so I, I'm really glad to hear that you uh, mentioned a potential area of priority for IMLS to be able to uh, support uh, libraries that are engaging in those uh, of working to develop the graduates from the schools or the col community colleges to fit in with specific skill sets for small businesses and how they can become part of that. So that was, a that was related to this particular. My broader question, uh, comment, is also what some of you mentioned, and it kind of resonates with the first session, where there was talk about stories of transformation, engagement, experience, and knowledge, and in this case, mentioning about capacity building and outcomes. Now, as the chair, co-chair for the uh, Elise conference that took place in Chicago 2015, reflections on social justice, and uh, uh, looking at the past and looking at the future, 
uh, also editing a, a library trends issue on social justice as well as a monograph by library juice press coming up soon one found that uh, from the for the library trends uh, a special issue 51 uh, submissions were presented on social justice but only 10 were accepted because of a lack of conceptualizing the work that we do in terms of learning is not just learning, but it should be connected to action and towards uh, tangible outcomes, as, as you pointed out. So maybe is there a need for us to conceptualize our work in a more assertive and aggressive manner beyond just learning, which is a little bit of more passive in my understanding, limited understanding about it. In, and so I would love to hear the comments from the audience and from the uh, panelists here in terms of embracing the understanding of social justice in terms of change, tangible change towards positive action, beyond <coughs> learning. Thanks, sorry, it was a bit uh, long. Uh, if, I, if I, David Lankis, Syracuse University, um, and actually I'm going to cheat because I want you to help me with my presentation at the end of the day. <laughs> because so far what I've heard is that we need to prepare librarians to um, work with immigrants, do adult learners, children play, uh, identify autism, be able to speak other languages, um, work in communications, uh, have broad skills. And, and Cindy, I want to pick up on your comment, which is if we expect librarians to do everything, then they will do nothing well. And, and it occurs to me that when we talk about the potential for broad impact, if we constantly believe, you know, what is the core skills that librarians bring? If we constantly expand and say, oh, here's a special population, let's go get an IMLS grant and we'll learn that, then you're gonna get a wonderful skill there locally. And it occurs to me that to have broad impact, we really need to focus what is core to librarianship, which to me is to facilitate the community sharing its expertise. Part of the way to look like the community is not just to hire them, but to actually put them in charge and invite them and mm -hmm. put them in front of classes. Part of the way that we, we deal with immigrant populations is as they go through this, they become part of the welcome process and the learning process. Part of what we talk about all of this is the idea that if, you know, as a librarian, I get frustrated because we think that we can train ourselves to be anything and oftentimes miss the most brilliant people who are coming into us, into our buildings every day, or more importantly, if we stop phrasing the problem as, if only, if how do we reach non-users to come to us? Why do we keep phrasing it that way as opposed to the problem of librarians not going to the community? A mm -hmm. And, and sorry, piece of frustration. So I guess I'm, I'm just picking up, what are these, what are the core skills? Do, do librarians have to be everything or can we talk in adult education and such about how they can facilitate that process without having to become mm -hmm. PhDs in every topic under the sun? Well, I would be happy to address that a little bit um, because I think that, in, in fact, we are still turning out librarians from our library schools who think it's their job to be everything, who think they should be the only people who work in libraries and uh, that they should have all the jobs in libraries, um, whether or not that happens to be their personal skill set. Um, and, and that's not really what we need our professionals to be. Um, we need people who know how to assess the needs of their community, who know how to create partnerships in their community um, in, in order to bring resources together and bring them to bear on, on the community's needs. We need project managers um, who know how to see a need and figure out how to bring together the resources to fulfill it. Um, we need people who want to get out of the library, get out from behind the desk, um, you know, really be people persons um, who aren't so totally devoted to books that they can't see that it's really people that are what our work is about. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it is a different skill set than, than, than we are necessarily seeing from, from some of our, even our new graduates still. So, um, so there is definitely work to do there. And, and I think the IMLS grant that we currently um, uh, are running, that we're on year two, is that's the particular challenge that we actually were posed because we had to develop this curriculum, which is, you know, it's huge in terms, and it goes from demographics, demographics analysis, 
community-based organizations and how to make referrals down to legal services and the whole citizenship process, right? So we're talking about a lot of content and how do, I mean, you can develop the curriculum, but how do you implement that and have librarians embrace that as something that, that they need to have, right? And so from the get-go, we surveyed them as part of the initial part of our curriculum development, and we actually uh, uh, put together focus groups that really had their input and contribution, and then we really hashed out what program or strategy we were gonna use in terms of implementing this. We don't expect librarians to be case managers, um, but we do expect for them to be facilitators of information, and I think that was the compromise that we came up with, because I think initially we were moving towards case management, which is really onerous, right, uh, be, being behind the desk, but, right, but they recognize the need for it. I mean, in Queens, you know, 40% of the population is foreign born, so they have to um, serve that need, but how do, you, how do you get them to embrace that, right? So we really define what the needs are. Currently, they're, you know, they're either going into our internal website to look for referral information and social services, or they're Googling certain sites. And so this curriculum really, uh, really provides them the information. And year three of the, uh, of the project is really devoted towards creating an online resource that would make it easier for them to access the information so they don't have to, you know. And this all came out during the discussion, during our focus group discussions during the survey. So I think we, you know, there's a certain, there's a certain sense, at least the, the sense that I'm feeling is that they, they, they're interested in it. They, they want to know more because it will benefit them in the end. And, it, and they, they do see it as continuing education to a certain degree. I don't have the answer on the librarian side of things, but I will say since we've had the learning lounge and all the things happening at the Providence and Cranston Public Libraries, um, um, our librarians are so relieved <laughs> to have solutions for people coming in. And they just love bringing people up. And, um, and that's really just taken off in many ways I would have never anticipated. And I will push back a little bit on the comment about um, why I'm 100% about we classroom walls falling down and library walls falling down. It's, it's absolutely here and needs to be. But I will say one thing because I am not a librarian and so I've been in all these other places and um, I, we do go out into the community but I still am, and I think I'm, I'm more strong in my opinion of this, is um, let's take those little steps to get them back to the library. Because what I've been finding is when we take, we serve whatever their need, the, the library goes out, serves the need out there. But if we can still hold some strings back to the library, then they get connected to other programs at, that they didn't even know existed. So I might go out to adult education and help someone with their English outside there. But we'll encourage, did you get a library card? So it's impacting the family in a more holistic way. So um, I still like that theme. Would you share the phrase that so that when you're out there, you are the library? That's exactly right. Then so that's part of the framing. Exactly. And that's yeah. why we need to be out there a lot because the reason what I heard from at least the new immigrant population is that they're too afraid to come in the doors. So getting that trust and face right outside will take those tiny steps in. Yes, that's a good way to phrase it. It's what needs to be done. And I'll just, I'll just add, I, I agree that librarians can't do everything, but one skill that every librarian needs to have is around community engagement and going out into the community, connecting with partners to get the kind of resources and uh, expertise that we don't have in the library that we need. Um, yes. Uh, Mary Stansbury, University of Denver, again. Um, a couple of comments that have come up in not only this presentation, but in um, a couple of the other ones relate to assessment skills. And uh, being from the proud state of Colorado, I just need to mention the Research Institute for Public Libraries, Ripple, um, that's the being supported by IMLS and is uh, happening this summer in the mountains outside of Colorado Springs. And the response to that institute is has been overwhelming, and I can only speak because I'm from the perspective of being on the advisory group, but obviously that's an area that's needed. Um, and public librarians in particular, I think academic librarians have a bit of an advantage because they're in that culture of assessment, but they still need those skills too. So wanted to mention that and thank IMLS too for that. Hi everybody, I'm Andrea Sines. I'm from Chicago Public Library. 
Uh, and I have two things. One is a comment and the other is a question. The first is a comment back to you, Carissa. We are trying to figure out how to make these peer learning um, opportunities available for adults in our library. It really started with the IMLS grant to launch the Makerspace a couple of years ago in our central library, and now we're taking that programming out across the system. It was inspired by the positive experience we had with UMedia and with you know interactive learning for little ones in the summer and after school, et cetera. And it has been incredibly well received by adults, right? The Maker Lab experience is a lot looser. It's very much exploratory the way that you media began. You know, whatever your interest is, let's have a, a place where you with other adults, often strangers, can explore your curiosity, your ideas, and get some support to do so and to make something that you know is valuable to you. So that's um, it's been really well received and positive. On the other side of the spectrum, we also are very much struggling with how do we help adults achieve some of their life goals, right? Learning goals in particular, whether they be in adult education or in something more advanced. And we just launched actually last week uh, four kind of exploratory prototypes of peer learning circles um, with uh, a partner called Peer to Peer University that's designed a lot of tools and facilitation guides that allow a paraprofessional in one of our libraries to launch a peer learning circle of, you know, between five and 10 people, adults who agree to meet with one another once a week while they are engaged in an online course. And during their engagement in an online course, some of the courses are in uh, GED math prep, some of the courses are in Python. So we are really experimenting with these, you know, very different ends of the learning spectrum. Um, we expect to see, you know, course completion go up really high because people are holding each other accountable. They're able to collaborate together and work together on projects. So we think that's very promising. We will share everything we learn you know, as widely as we can. I hope IMLS will help us do so. Um, and then we look to expand this uh, moving forward. And, and we think it's something that is scalable you know, in, across uh, all libraries. Um, the second thing really is just a question for Dio about the staffing model in your library. It sounds like you are uh, organized very differently than most libraries I've seen. Uh, if you have staff that are actually teaching course content and doing things that in many libraries, you know, are things that other, that outside partners are doing. So if you could just talk a little bit about how you're organized and who's staffing all of these courses. Yeah, and I think it really starts with the strategic plan for the library. I, I think for a lot of the work that we have done historically and con will continue to do in the future, it really goes back to the strategic plan because it's about you're looking for funding for it, right? And whenever there's a, 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 a rationale to apply for a particular type of funding to be able to fully staff all of our adult learning centers, we go back to that. Is it part of our mission? Is it part of the organization's vision? Um, but, as, but as it relates to the staffing model, yes, we, we, we have all of our teachers are part-time, although we're, we're moving towards a full-time instructional teacher because uh, we feel that you know a lot of our teachers who are part-time are teaching at other organizations and we, we, we develop them and then they go somewhere else. So we really are moving towards um, that kind of model. Secondly, each of the adult learning center has a, um, a center manager, an assistant manager, uh, an assistant center manager that really looks at accountability, outcomes, you know, attendance retention. Each um, center also has a literacy specialist who's focused on, on the classroom and professional development and the needs of our, uh, our staff as well as you know, a, a data manager, a data coordinator, et cetera. But we're also moving towards really putting people in functional groups. So we have a case management cabinet that discusses all of the particular case studies that they've encountered and do a lot of lessons learned and best practices. That's something that's fairly new that we've started. We also have a data management cabinet as well as a management cabinet for supervisor, um, supervisory as, as well as strategic planning. Um, so we've really looked at not just the staffing model but the support for the staffing model and creating the structure because we, we have a pretty ambitious uh, goal in terms of how we want to expand. No, because we know the funding is going to be coming, and so we want to be ready for that to be able to enhance with all of these, you know, standards and all the requirements that's going to be required. So yes, so uh, su supervisory staff, literacy specialists that look at professional development as well as all of these cabinet groups that support the the, uh, the operations. I was going to make a comment that kind of ties to funding is coming out of our mouths a lot, <laughs> if you noticed, <laughs> <laughs> and um, it. And to some degree, I mean, I'm, I'm housed in a library too, but um, I have to raise all my own grant funds to make that happen, but yet we are the library. And so um, we're often to the side, 
And um, so that's why it's challenging with the funding. And so it does, roots are back into the strategic plan. And so I think that's why you're hearing some of the things you're hearing. I wanted to just make a point about our We Speak Your Language initiative um, uh, that kind of relates a little bit to what David was saying before. Um, one of the things that we found by, is that by creating um, positions that have required bilingual, bicultural knowledge, skills, and abilities, um, but that don't require an MLS, it is a great way to recruit a more diverse group of people to library school. Um, a lot of those folks actually do end up deciding that the library is a great place to work that they would never have thought about before. They want a career in libraries and they choose to go to library school. Hi, this is Cindy Lombardo, Cleveland Public Library. And I don't know that this is a question specific to this panel, but I'm hoping that at some point during the day, someone addresses it. Um, my question has to do with when you are in a unionized, contentious unionized setting, and you are trying to switch from a transactional culture to a transformative learning organization, where staff are expected to develop and utilize new skills. Is there anyone in the room who has had experience with not just doing that, but the questions of how that is, how that influences compensation structures and performance management systems? It's a big question. So if anybody has the answer, I would really love to hear it. I can actually speak a little bit to that, but I would probably also refer you to our HR professionals um, at Multnomah County Library um, and to uh, Rita Jimenez, who is actually, he, she's our neighborhood libraries director, but has also um, been in charge of our, our We Speak Your Language in initiative for many years now. And we did have to do a tremendous amount of work with our union, with our HR practices, um, and um, looking at what the competencies are for various positions in the organization. And it has not necessarily been a smooth ride all the way. Um, I think it's probably an easier sell uh, to some extent in Portland because we have, you know, that liberal vibe and people, you know, know what they're supposed to think about that um, based on what all of their neighbors, neighbors think. But when push comes to shove and there's a job that you don't qualify anymore, um, because uh, suddenly um, the person in it needs to have an African-American cultural competency or needs to um, be able to speak Spanish um, or Russian or Vietnamese or Chinese um, and be culturally competent in, tho in those areas, um, then, then it's, you know, people don't feel quite as, as good about that as maybe they would have before. So it's been a long transition for us, um, but We've, pr we've been at it for probably 15 years or so now. Um, and it has, it has made a tremendous difference in the way that our community sees the library. Um, so it's definitely worth doing the work um, because the people who come into our library are now much more reflective of the community we're serving. Um, we're going out and doing outreach in parts of the community that we were not really getting to um, when we didn't have people who could speak the language and, and who people felt comfortable with. Um, and it's all about how, how comfortable you feel that someone shares your experience and, and really um, can talk to you. Uh, but HR practices like, um, if you wanted to be a page at our library and you were a high school kid, um, you were competing with people who had a PhD who wanted to work at the library, or people who had an MFA and, and wanted their library job to support their, um, you know, it was their day job to support their art, whatever that might be. Um, so we've completely changed practices like the way we draw pools of people we're going to interview out of the pools of people who have made it through the first part of the civil service process. Um, by drawing random pools, we've broken down some of the barriers. I mean, there's some very nitty gritty kinds of things that, that you can do um, that level the playing field a little bit and make sure that you're um, interviewing a more diverse group of people than if you just started with the top people on the civil service exam and, and you know, went down um, 
there are different ways of, of recruiting that, that can make it easier. Um, and, you know, the bilingual bicultural competencies were definitely in negotiation with our union um, and something that we have had to talk with our staff about over time. Um, the rest of the county was definitely on board. That has helped us. Um, and, and so, but again, I think some of the experts can really help you with ideas for how to make that work better. I think for, I mean, it's an ongoing pro process. And I, I think, you know, for many, for, for all of our grant funded programs, they're all very driven by attendance and retention, goals and outcomes, post-test rate, um, you know, educational gain, right? And so we've tried to streamline all of the performance uh, um, evaluations um, all so that everybody's on the same page and everybody's working towards something. Um, and so this, it's always a, a, an ongoing negotiation process. Uh, with the union, and I think a lot of it is uh, try to uh, convey what the you know the importance of it is. And I think one one of the things that we've done is really do, you know do the graduation because you can actually see in real life. Um, one of the things that that, that was really I, I think very visceral for me was that you know when you go to a typical graduation, you have young people who don't really have much life experience. They're looking forward, uh, you know, because it's their potential. But these are graduates who are who have children, who have kids, and when they go up there and speak and give testimonials, they talk about you know the struggles that they went through um, and all of it very rocky. But they have kids and they have you know, wonderful things um, planned for the future. And I think for many of our staff who are invited to this graduation, that becomes the motivation as opposed to anything that is, you know, uh, um, uh, um, in terms of performance target, the numbers. So we try to combine both numbers to try to get everybody to work together, but it is an ongoing process. But I think at the end of the day, uh, it's those stories that I think really make an impact and remind us why, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I, and there's nothing to be said. I mean, you, you can't understate that enough um, or overstate that enough. Overstate. Sorry. <laughs> we do I'm a second language learner. I still make, get yeah. things mixed <laughs> up. Sorry. <laughs> um, I know uh, there are other questions today. Uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, so it's lunchtime. But our panelists will be around, and I would encourage you to talk with them. Um, you can see that they're doing some incredibly innovative things in their libraries. Adult learning is, is hard <laughs> because it's so big. Getting your arms around it and around specific things within adult learning is hard. But, but I'm really encouraged about all the great work that's happening out there. So join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs>